Has there ever been a question that just completely stumped you? Maybe you can remember a time in school, or maybe for some of you younger folks who are in school, you're taking a test and you sat there and you looked at that paper and you thought to yourself, I have no idea what the answer is. That was me in the, on my math test, whenever I get to the word problems, you know, those are always the toughest ones, the hardest ones, I'd sit there and had no idea what to do. The other night I was watching the Jay Leno show, that's what happens when you're up feeding a baby late at night, you know, I used to tend to watch these kind of shows, and he was doing a segment called Jaywalking, and basically the premise of it, if you've never seen it, is Jay Leno goes around Universal Studios in Hollywood, and he asks people seemingly basic questions that in the end they usually don't know the answer to. There was one such girl on this episode who was totally stumped. He asked her a pretty easy question. He asked her, name just one country that borders the United States. Just one. She thought about it, and thought about it, and thought about it, until finally saying, I don't know, Europe? She didn't know that one. So then he tried to ask her a different question. He started asking her questions about the flag, and she knew that the stars represented all the states. So then Leno asked her, how many states are there? She thought about it, she said, 52. This girl was a little stumped that evening. Well, looking at the Gospel of Matthew this morning, we just heard from moments ago, we find a group of religious teachers who are trying their best to stump Jesus. They are trying some way to find a question that he either doesn't know the answer to or gives the wrong answer to. Basically, Matthew 22 is all about this. We heard last week a little bit about that. They asked Jesus about taxes, trying to trick him, trying to see where his loyalties lie. But they couldn't do it. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, to God what is God. Other times, the Sadducees, a group of people who did not believe in life after death, who did not believe in the resurrection, try and trip up Jesus over that question. But again, they fail. So today, the religious leaders, and specifically these Pharisees, come to Jesus with one more question that they think will stump Jesus. If we can't get him on taxes, if we can't get him on the resurrection, let's try and get him on the law. So we pick up the account of verse 34 of our gospel today. And there we read, when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? So here in the text, the Pharisees send a lawyer to Jesus. Now you can save your lawyer jokes for another time because this is not a lawyer as we think of one. Rather, this is somebody who knew all about the laws in the Old Testament. This was somebody who poured over books like Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and knew them backwards and forwards. So he comes to Jesus with this question about the law. The people who send him, the Pharisees, they love laws too. In fact, they thought the whole Bible, the whole revelation of God was only about do's and don'ts. God himself didn't necessarily matter. What really mattered was following the rules, figuring out how to do so. So this lawyer asked Jesus, out of all those do's and don'ts in the Old Testament, out of all those laws, which one do you think it's the greatest one. Really, they're asking a pretty deep question here, a pretty interesting question, because not only are they asking, pick your favorite command, but basically their question boils down to this. What is the meaning of the entire Old Testament? What is the meaning behind God's revelation for all those thousands of years? So what do you think? How would you answer it? If you had to pick one command that you thought was the best, what might you say? Maybe you'd pick, you shall have no other gods. That seems rather obvious. Or maybe you'd pick, thou shalt not kill. Because that's pretty important, right? I mean, none of us want to be killed. Or thou shalt not steal or commit adultery. What would you say is the meaning behind the Old Testament? That's a little trickier, isn't it? Well, Jesus gives his answer starting at verse 37. We read, he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus' answer to them is rather simple. He says, you know what the greatest commandment is? You know what the fulfillment of the entire Old Testament is about? It's about love. It's about one simple little word. Love. He says all the prophets, all the laws, everything you read about in the Old Testament, that's what it was about. Do you think Jesus is right? When you've read the Old Testament, when you've heard stories from it, does it seem like it's a book about love? What about when you read about, say, Sodom and Gomorrah? Or the flood with Noah? Or all that judgment God brought on Egypt when he saved Israel? Does that seem like love? Jesus says that the heart of it all really is the love of God. If we stop and think about it, Jesus is right. If we think about the overarching story of the Old Testament, at the center is this God who desires to love humanity. He wants them to be his people. He wants to be their God. You look at something as simple as the Ten Commandments, that's really what it was all about. The first three are about our relationship with God. The last seven are about our relationship with each other. It's about love. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, we see God's love. We see him create everything that there is. He calls it very good. He walks with man and woman in the garden. He joins them together in marriage. Everything is perfect. Everything is filled with love. But then humanity falls into sin. But God still brings his love. He promises that through the seed of Eve, one will come to make things right. Later on in the Old Testament, God raises up a people called Israel. They get into trouble. They get into slavery. But God hears their cries, and he delivers them. Later on in the prophets, guys like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they urge the people to love the Lord, to love each other. But they fail. Israel doesn't love God. They chase after idols. They don't love each other. Instead, they, they overlook the poor. They play favors. They look at worship as just a going through the motions. Just another rule to follow. Yet in the midst of all that sin and rebellion, God promises through those same prophets that he'll raise up somebody to make things right. He will raise up one person to bring the love of God to the world. Jesus is right. At the heart of it all is love. Now the opponents of Jesus, these Pharisees we hear from this morning, they wouldn't agree. See, to them, the scriptures are not at all about love. They're just about doing things because God says so. They have no concept of a relationship with God, even no concept of a relationship between other human beings. Everything is about do's and don'ts for the sake of do's and don'ts. That was the problem. They left out love. They interpreted the scriptures without that lens of God's love. It's tempting for us to do the same. In fact, it's rather easy for us to get caught up in that same trap, to leave out love. So when we look at worship, when we look at life with God, it's just sort of this going through the motions, you know, checking off the checklist. I went to church on Sunday. I'm good to go. We left out love. When we look at our interactions with our neighbor, it's just something I sort of do to try and please God, rather than seeing it as something that actually benefits those around us. We've left out love. When we look at God and we see only this almighty being in the sky who just gives out rules and we must follow them or we will get zapped, we've left out love. But the scriptures truly reveal to us and what Jesus clearly shows is that God really is about love. He desires a relationship with us. He desires that he would love us, we would love him in return, and out of that we would love each other. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, they just, they couldn't get that. They were stumped. Sometimes so are we. 
we struggle to see that God truly does love us. That God really is interested in our lives. That he is not remote. He's not off in the distance. He actually thinks and cares about every one of us. Back here in Matthew, the Pharisees didn't really realize what they were getting themselves into with Jesus. They thought they could stump him, but as we're going to see soon, Jesus turns the tables. Take a look at verse 41 with me. It says, Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand. Until I put your enemies under your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Jesus decides, let's continue this dialogue about the scriptures. But let's not just talk about laws. Let's talk about God's promises. Let's talk about that person the Lord says is going to come into the world. So he quotes Psalm 110. Where King David, the greatest king in all of Israel, is talking about this coming Messiah that God was sent into the world. And he says, yes, this, this Messiah is going to be from my line, but he's also going to be greater than me. He is going to be my Lord. Jesus asked the Pharisees, how can that be? How can that possibly happen? Did you catch how the Pharisees responded? They were stunned. They have no idea how to respond. It says in verse 46, No one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Turns out the Pharisees didn't know the scriptures quite like they thought. It turns out when they didn't look at him through that lens of love and God's activity in the world, they missed out on something rather big. They missed out on the truth. That God was going to become man. That this whole question of how could David's son be David's Lord means that the Messiah, the, the Christ, was going to be somebody born from the physical line of David, yet be greater than him at the same time. The only way that could happen is if God got into the picture. The only way that could happen is if God became man. Now, Jesus is asking this question to the Pharisees not because he wants them to come to the right theological conclusions here. He doesn't ask it of us just so we can maybe quote the catechism on what it says about this. Jesus asks this question so that we clearly see who it is that's in their midst. So that we see what has actually happened in the world. God has come down to us. God lived and walked and breathed amongst human beings. Yes, Jesus is born from the line of David, but he's also true God from heaven. And that stumps the Pharisees. They just can't figure that out. They can't fathom how God would become man or even why he would do it in the first place. And see, that question still stumps so many. Yet it really boils down to relating to this whole idea of love we've been talking about from the very beginning. If God's love is going to have its way in the world, if God's love is going to enter into our lives, it's not going to depend on us. See, Jesus told us today, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And if we're being truly honest, how do we do it, those two things? Do we love God all the time, with all of our being? Maybe even a better question is, do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Every single neighbor? See, only the most naive person would say that we do. We know we make mistakes. We know that we fail. The only way God's love can come into this world is if God himself comes down and makes it happen. The only way we can experience and see God's love is not if he stays distant. It's not if he just speaks from heaven. It's not if he threatens judgment. It's if God comes down and loves us through his actions. That is the only way 
will ever see and will ever know. That is why God became man. It's why the Christ, Jesus, is David's son and David's Lord. Jesus is God in the flesh. God in space and time and history for us to bring us the love of God. You look at Jesus' ministry, that is what it was all about. It wasn't about the do's and the don'ts. It's about bringing God's love to us. If you look at Jesus, what do you see? You see somebody who gathers to himself some simple fishermen who had nothing going for him and says, you be my disciples. He gathers together around himself tax collectors, sinners, the most hated people in all of society, and he eats them. He tells them their sin is forgiven. They are right with God. He takes upon himself those who are sick and hurting and heals them. And in his greatest act of love, the one that the whole world clearly sees, Jesus takes up the cross. He takes up all those times we've made mistakes, all the regrets, all the guilt. He gives his life so that you and I could be completely forgiven, totally right, totally loved by God. It's an amazing thing. Jesus loves people who do not love perfectly so that they can be perfectly loved by God. This past week in the news, you might have heard a big story that came out of Israel. There was this huge trade-off of prisoners between the Israeli government and the Palestinians. But the interesting thing about it was that the Israeli government traded over a thousand prisoners of war, people who were considered bad guys in Israel, for one soldier. One soldier. Now that seems rather surprising, right? To give up over a thousand of your enemies to get one person back. If the government said they believed this would aid in the peace process. And the father of that one soldier who got to come home said, Today we can say that we have experienced the rebirth of a son. Now, many would say that's a pretty high price to pay to have peace. Many would say it probably isn't worth it just to get one man back. It reminds us of the great lengths that Christ went to have us. Jesus gave up everything for you and me. Jesus gave his life. It was the ultimate trade. And he didn't do it when we were at our best or when we were at our brightest, but when we were at our worst. When the world showed its most ugly side in crucifying God's Son, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. He says the same to you and me. Father, forgive them. He shows us God's love. And perhaps that stumps people. Perhaps that even stumps us. Why would God do such a thing? The reason is that God is not like we think. He's not the ultimate judge in the sky. But he is love. See, when we look at Jesus, and we see God in this world, and we see him up there on that cross, we'll never look at God the same way again. We can't. We can't look at God and say, there's the big guy in the sky. Because it's not who he is. He was down here amongst us. Nor can we look at him anymore and say, well, there's the judge. There's the guy who's looking to see if I'm doing right or wrong, if I've been naughty or nice. Can't say that either. Because this God is love. This God forgives. We can never look at him the same way again. And we don't want to. But in the same token, we can't look at each other the same way either. No longer can we look at our neighbor and say, well, there's that guy I don't really like all that much. Or there's that person I'm holding that grudge against for all these years. Can't do that either. Because now we see who everybody is. We see everybody as somebody Jesus died for. We see everybody as somebody that God loves very much. So we can never look at each other the same way again. That's what Jesus is trying to get us to see 
this morning. It's trying to get us to look even deeper and see even bigger things out of God than just somebody who gives us ten commandments or rules to follow. He's trying to get us to see God as the one. A God who loves us and a God who enables us to love each other. Let's go to him now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we struggle with loving you and loving our neighbor as we should. But we thank you because of your infinite love for us. Love that is based on grace and mercy. We can now know your love and love you and love our neighbor. We pray, Lord, that as you struggle and even as we fail, that you would forgive us and enable us to do this daily. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.